You know, what often seems the case as I was reflecting back on the last couple of years, that as we go through great difficulty, we're often reminded of what is important and what is not important. Another reminder that comes our way when we go through a challenging circumstances, which I think we can all relate. We've all hurt. We've all lost. We have all been challenged. And we're reminded that life is actually indeed very fragile. When we lose a loved one, we're reminded that life is indeed precious and it's also very short. When we finally realize also that life is short and it is indeed precious, we can head in the completely wrong direction by coming to the conclusion that, you know, since life is so short, I might as well just get what I can while I can get it. I might as well just go after everything that this world has to offer because really that is it. I'll just accumulate and experience as much as I possibly can. And that perspective can drive us to obtain that which we do not have. And so we're chasing after something. We're driven to acquire. And then even that which we do have, we desire to have more of it. Even one of the richest men in the world was interviewed and asked, how much money is enough money? And his response baffled his audience, where he said, just a little bit more. And really, that is what it's like in this world, that there's always just a little bit more to be had. There's always a nicer home or a nicer car or a better vacation or whatever it might be. And we realize at some point, sooner or later, that we'll come to the end of our journey in the same way that we came into the world with nothing is the same way that we will leave because we can't take anything with us. Jesus asked this question. And really, it's something that we should ask. What would I trade for my soul? In Matthew 16, verses 25 through 26, this is the first book of the New Testament. Jesus said, if you try to hang on to your life, you will lose it. But if you give up your life for my sake, you will save it. And what do you benefit if you gain the whole world but lose your soul? If you arrive at that point, that point in your life, where there's this culmination of the realization that life is short, it doesn't last long, and that there must be something more to this life, there must be something more than just getting what you can get, and then it's the end. The end. When you get to that point in your life, you start to think about the things that are very important. Maybe even today you've never heard that God has created you for a purpose and for a reason for you to know Him. That we're a spiritual being. We're not just limited by this physical body. Our physical bodies do not last forever. They break down. They deteriorate. You know, when you're young, you don't have the pains and aches that you have when you get older. Beauty fades. Strength fades. Because our physical bodies do not last. But we'll seek to prolong our days. You know, some of our most recent studies from some of our wisest science scientists and, and researchers have shown us that increasing one's lifespan by exercising and removing sugar from your diet and living a relatively stress-free life is nearly impossible for 10 out of every 10 people will die. In the Gospel of John, there's an account of a man named Lazarus and he died and he had two sisters named Mary and Martha. Maybe you've heard this story. And they were upset that their brother had died. And even more so, it seemed that Jesus didn't come through for them. Because if Jesus would have arrived when they needed him to arrive, their brother would still be alive. And I wonder if there are any of you here today that maybe you've never stepped into a church. You've never stepped foot into a church. Maybe today, you are in that position where you've had things that have got your attention. You've had those difficulties. You've had those challenges. You've had those hurts, those pains. And I wonder if you found yourself in a bad spot, maybe estranged from God because you felt at some point in your past that Jesus didn't come through for you. 
Maybe you can relate to Mary and Martha thinking, you know, I prayed for this and it didn't happen. I asked for God. I asked for God to give me something and I didn't get it. Maybe you prayed for someone to be healed and they weren't. And quite possibly that unanswered prayer or more likely the case, the prayer that was not answered the way you were hoping it to be answered has been the very thing that is hindering you from a personal relationship with God. Maybe you found yourself at an impasse. I mean, are you at a dead end? Are you experiencing things now where you're looking at really the reality of life? How priorities begin to shift? How arguments don't seem so important anymore? How all of a sudden now I realize that, you know, life is valuable, life is short, and it doesn't last forever. Maybe you've had something pop up in your life where it's brought you to the end of your rope. You've had something happen to you. Maybe it's a financial burden. You know, with our, goodness gracious, with our, with our increasing prices of everything, with inflation. You know, living in Southern California, even living in this city. Maybe you have carried a financial burden here this morning. Maybe you're battling with something with your health, like my friend who just completed his third round of chemotherapy, and just last night he texted me that he was, felt like he was living in a nightmare. Maybe it could be a strain on your marriage or on your family. Maybe there's a problem with one of your children, and it's taken a toll. You know, for my family, as I mentioned, we have four kids, four beautiful children, three boys and one girl. You know, I always joke about this story because we had two older kids, my son Hudson and my daughter Ava, 13 and 11. And then we had about a seven-year gap, and we had Harrison, and he's five now. And then we joke that just because my wife and I hated sleep so much, we thought we'd have another child. And we had baby George, number four. And you know, my daughter was born with a really severe disability where she cannot speak and she cannot walk. And it's heartbreaking. And we all wrestle with things. Each one of us in our own families, we have things that are very hard, nearly bringing us to that point where we feel like we're going to break. And in our story, Mary and Martha, their brother was dead, and it doesn't get any more dead than dead. It was a case closed. Jesus, you let me down. Jesus, if you would have been here, my brother wouldn't have died. Yet in their darkest hour, there was this realization that there's actually more than just this life. In John chapter 11, it says, Martha says to Jesus, Lord, if you, have, if you had only been here, my brother would not have died. But even now, listen to this. She says, I know that God will give you whatever you ask. Jesus told her, your brother will rise again. And listen to Martha. She says, yes, Lord, I know. He will rise when everyone else rises at the last day. Ultimately, acknowledging that every single person on the faith, face of this earth will give an account to the Lord, the resurrection, that we will stand before God. All of us, no matter where we're from, no matter who we are, but for those who know Jesus personally, there is a very special promise that is given. And it's a promise of forgiveness of sins and everlasting life. And Jesus replied to Martha, he said, Martha, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he may die, he shall live. And whoever lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? He asks. Jesus, the resurrection and the life. Jesus, the one who just a few days ago we celebrated on Good Friday, Jesus laying down his life for the sins of the world, that no matter what we have done, no matter what sins we've ever committed, that we find forgiveness through faith in Jesus. Because this physical body will come to its end, but our spirit will live forever. And Jesus asked Martha this very simple question that I'm asking you today. Well, do you believe this? Do you believe, is there something inside of you that says, well, there's got to be something more to this life? Maybe you've even been randomly reading the Bible or bumping into people from different churches. Or maybe you're even here today wondering, how in the world am I at an Easter service? 
If any of my friends knew that I was at an Easter church service, they'd probably be thinking, have I lost my mind? But you're here. And maybe you're seeking. Jesus is the resurrection and the life. In John 3, verse 16, it says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, that whoever would believe in him would not perish, but have everlasting life. And Martha replies to Jesus and says, Yes, Lord, I believe you are the Christ, the Son of God who has come into the world. That's what we're celebrating today. That's why we're at this Great Park Baseball Stadium. And maybe there are some of you who would never go inside of a church, and so we brought it outside on this beautiful spring day. Where that you might hear, where you might hear that there is a God in heaven who loves you who sent his only son Jesus to die on the cross for you, meaning every wrong you have ever committed, everything that you have ever done that was evil, that was against God, can be forgiven. And not only that, it doesn't stop there. That when our day comes, when our time on this earth has concluded, that we have that hope now of eternal life in heaven because of what Jesus did. After Jesus was crucified, the religious leaders of the day went to Pilate. Pilate was the Roman governor. His, our historical documents substantiate what the Bible claims. The historicity of the Bible is completely in line with secular history. The places that were spoken of, the people that were referred to, are all in alignment. And the religious leaders of the day went to the Roman governor, Pilate, and they said this in Matthew chapter 27, verse 62. They said to Pilate, Sir, we remember that while Jesus was still alive, that that deceiver said, after three days, I will rise. The religious leaders knew that Jesus said that after three days, he would rise again. So we have the chief priests, which were the Sadducees and the Pharisees, who, by the way, each hated each other. And I find that pretty ironic that two people groups that absolutely hated each other joined together to try to stop Jesus. And here we see the actual connivers, the actual plotters, the actual deceitful workers. We're calling Jesus a deceiver. And so we see that not only is the report of the centurion that pierced Jesus' side with that spear that Jesus was dead, that as they went through to break the legs of the prisoners that were crucified that day with Jesus, they found that Jesus was already dead. He gave up his spirit. He said, I have the power to lay down my life. I have the power to take it up again. And so, in Matthew 27, it says, the religious leaders told uh, Pilate, command that the tomb be made secure until the third day, lest his disciples come by night and steal him away and say to the people, he has risen from the dead. So the last deception will be worse than the first. I wonder when you think about it, what were the religious leaders even afraid of? What were they worried about? Truly, it couldn't have been the disciples that would try to break Jesus out of the tomb that he was laid in. They were already hiding and fearful for their lives. The religious leaders were afraid of the power of Jesus. And Pilate said to them, you have a guard. Go your way. Make it secure as you know how. And we know from Latin and some of the original languages in the text that, that indicated a Roman guard, that a Roman guard would be assigned to the tomb of Jesus. And it says, so they went to the tomb, they made it secure, and they sealed the stone setting the guard. We see three times recorded for us that the tomb was secured. And not only was it secured with an attachment of troops, but we also see that there was a rope that was draped across it, and then with wax it was sealed. And that seal carried the power of Rome, that if you were to break that seal, then you would be infringing upon the law of Rome. This would be a very serious infraction. And so the tomb was made secure. What an amazing, amazing story. And it says, now after the Sabbath at the first day of the week, Matthew 28, verse 1, and this is what we're celebrating today, that Mary Magdalene and the other Mary came to see the tomb where Jesus had been laid. And behold, there was a great earthquake, 
For an angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone from the door and sat on it. His countenance was like lightning and his clothing was as white as snow. And the Roman guards shook for fear of him and became like dead men. But the angel answered and said to the women, not to the Roman soldiers, might I add, but to the women, do not be afraid, for I know you seek Jesus who was crucified. You know, for the person that is seeking Jesus, the person that knows Jesus personally, there is nothing to be fearful of when it comes to death. And yes, death is a huge phobia. Yes, we worry about what will happen after this life. I realize I can't take any of these things with me. But then I look at the truth of God's word. I look at really When I see my life, and if I'm honest with myself, I'll say, well, who hasn't done wrong things? Who hasn't thought a bad thought? Who hasn't taken something that hasn't been theirs or looked at something and wanted it for themselves? Who has not ever cursed or ever gotten angry and lost their temper? I mean, there are so many things that if we're honest with ourselves, we're like, yeah, we're human beings. We make mistakes. Well, the Bible actually calls that sin. It's to miss the mark of God's perfect standards. And the Bible tells us that the wages of sin is death. That sin separates us from the Lord. And that's why Jesus came and died, to pay the price for our sin, so that I wouldn't have to die for my sin. Jesus took my place. In Colossians 2, verses 13 through 14, it says, You were dead because of your sins, and because your sinful nature was not yet cut away. Then, though, God made you alive with Christ, for he forgave all our sins. He canceled the record of the charges against us and took it away by nailing it to the cross. This is called the good news of the gospel. This isn't you trying to stand on your tippy toes to try to reach God. Most people today, if you would interview them and say, hey, how do you get to heaven? They would say, well, be a good person. You gotta be a good person. I wonder how many of you have ever heard somebody say that or maybe you've even thought that yourself. Have you ever wondered, though, honestly, where that line is that separates you from being a good person to being a bad person? Have you ever wondered where that line actually is? Where How do I cross over? And you'll say, well, you know, you got to do good deeds. You know, hopefully your good deeds will outweigh your bad deeds. But the reality is this, is that good deeds do not remove sin. You might have a whole bunch of good deeds, and you might be a, a person that does good things. But that never deals with the issue of sin, the things that I've done that were wrong before God. That's why Jesus came. That's why Jesus came and died on the cross. That's the good news for you, the good news for me. And as Mary and the other Mary were there at the tomb, it says that the angel in verse 6 of Matthew 28 said, Jesus isn't here, for he is risen as he said. Come, see the place where the Lord lay. And quickly, go tell his disciples that he has risen from the dead and indeed is going before you into Galilee. And there you will see him. Behold, I have told you. Jesus rose from the dead. He's not there. He had the power to lay his life down. That's why he said, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. And he gave up his ghost. He also has the power to take it up again. But you know what that means for you and what it means for me is that that same power that raised Jesus from the dead will raise us into eternal life. That's a hope that's worth living for. But that tomb is empty without Jesus. And I don't know if you've realized this or not, but so is our life without him. Empty. I think the best way for me to describe it would be that God has given each of us a God-shaped void in our hearts, in our lives. And you might try to fill it with experiences, with money, with possessions, you name it. You can try to fill that void, something that might bring you contentment. And that contentment only lasts a very short amount of time. Because then it's the next thing, and then it's the next thing, and then it's the next thing after that. And then you live your life, and you look back, and you say, I have spent my entire life chasing after things that didn't matter and that I cannot take with me. I tried to fill that void with everything that the world has to offer, and it did not bring fulfillment. And the sad truth is that you'll actually hunger more and more 
for more things. You actually thirst more and more for those things. Like you'll have to have them, knowing that they don't bring you fulfillment. Pleasure, pleasurable for a moment, I would say, but it doesn't last forever. Maybe you've had some of those experiences that I referenced at the beginning of our time together, and they've got your attention. And maybe you said to yourself, you know what, I think I need to start cleaning up my life. I think it's maybe time for me to start working on being a better person. You know, I'm maybe going to stop, you know, partying so much or drinking so much or using or doing these things that I know that are destructive. Maybe my relationships, I've been bouncing from one relationship to the next and it never works out. I'm always making the same mistakes. You know, I'm going to try to get my life together, clean it up, do a better job. Maybe you've even said to yourself, you know what, I think I might even try to become religious. Maybe I'll, I'll try to, you know, go to church or I'll, I'll do something that might help me be a better person. Do you know that there are so many people today that have said, you know, I tried the whole Jesus church thing and it just didn't work out for me. I really did. I tried my best, but I couldn't do it. And the frustration lies in that we think that, you know, if I clean up the outside of who I am, that somehow that will migrate and make its way inside and change who I am as a person that only I see and God sees. But then you realize, man, that's futile. We get frustrated, then we get discouraged, and then we're like, ah, oh, forget it, I can't do it. See, the opposite applies to having a relationship with Jesus. See, I would even go as far to say that religion would say, try to clean up the outside. The relationship that I'm talking to you about that you can personally have with Jesus today, it changes who you are on the inside. And then that internal transformation makes its way outside. So the things that I'm thinking and the way that I'm speaking, the way that I'm treating other people, the way that I'm living has been absolutely transformed. All the guilt that I've carried from my past mistakes and my sin, Jesus has forgiven me of all of them. You know how good that feels to not carry that burden around? The good news. But even with good deeds and morality, you're still like that empty tomb without Jesus. You may look all cleaned up on the outside for a matter of time, and then you're still faced with that problem of sin. Religion doesn't remove sin, nor do good deeds. It only masks it. Only a relationship with Jesus personally will remove your sins from you. And so, Jesus paid the price on the cross for our sins. And then he conquered death when he rose again. That's what we're singing about today. He rose again because of what he told Martha. Do you remember he said, I am the resurrection and I am the life. He who believes in me, though he shall die, yet he shall live. Do you have that hope? Do you have that forgiveness of sins? We live in a world that seems to be getting more and more difficult. There's wars and rumors of wars. You see what's happening with Russia and the Ukraine. We see what's happening in the Middle East. We see what's happening in our own country. People turning on each other and there's division and there's anger and there's hostility. There's health crisis and there's financial woes. There's all of these things happening right now and I believe that they're being used maybe even one last time by God to get our attention that life truly is short. It matters what happens after this life. And when you place your faith in Jesus, something miraculous happens. The Bible tells us that he makes us alive. Those of us who were dead in our sins, we are now what is called, Jesus called it, born again. Made alive spiritually. Dead in sins is what we are without Jesus. And if Jesus would not have risen from the dead, then we would still and forever remain dead in our sins. But because he rose from the grave, we see in Romans 8, 11, if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. And so as we conclude, No matter where you're from, 
no matter what you've done, no matter who you were when you came in these gates today and you looked out at this field and maybe even thought as I did, I was like, wow, what a beautiful day. What a beautiful place. But for you who don't know Jesus personally, and maybe you have been searching, or maybe at one point in your life, you know, you were walking with God and you've walked away. What a day to remember on April 17th on Easter Sunday at the very first ever Easter service at the Great Park Championship Baseball Stadium that you met God personally in a real way. In a real way. Jesus is standing at the door and knocking at your heart. Right now. Maybe Jesus has already been knocking at the door of your life for some time. Regardless of how long it's been or how short it's been, I'm going to give you the opportunity as we conclude in just a moment here that if you've never received forgiveness of sins, if you have never committed your life to Jesus, if you would like to have that assurance that after you live your life, which is short here, that you might spend eternity in heaven, then I'm going to give you that chance to receive that forgiveness and receive through faith in Jesus that life that is promised to us. And then you'll find that all the difficulties, all the problems, all of those things that you've wrestled with that have even brought you to this point right now were being used to point you to your Savior, the God who created you, the God who sent his only son, Jesus, to die on the cross for you. As a church, we celebrate the resurrection of Jesus. But you know, the resurrection is good and it's not so good too. And you might wonder, well, how is that? Well, I'd like you to listen, and this is the last passage of Scripture that I'm going to read. It's from John chapter 5, verses 24 through 30. Jesus says this, I tell you the truth. Those who listen to my message and believe in God, and believe in God who sent me, have eternal life. They will never be condemned for their sins, but they have already passed from death into life. And I assure you that the time is, is coming, indeed it's here now, that when the dead hear the voice of the Son of God, that those who listen will live. The Father has life in himself and he has granted that same life-giving power to his Son. And he has given him authority to judge everyone because he is the Son of Man. Don't be surprised. Indeed, the time is coming when all the dead in their graves will hear the voice of God's Son and they will rise again. Now listen to this. This is the key. Those who have done good will rise to experience eternal life. And those who have continued in evil will rise to experience judgment. So this is what makes the resurrection of Jesus so important and so pertinent for us today. If we will all stand and give an account to God, and the resurrection is indeed true, and Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life, and I will stand before God one moment in time, I will either give an account as being covered through faith in Jesus or be one that has rejected Jesus and that offer of forgiveness. Some of you might be saying, you know, well, you don't know where I'm from. You don't know what I've done. That's true, I may not, but God does. He knew every sin you would ever commit before you were even born and still sent his only son, Jesus, to die on the cross for you so that you might have this opportunity. We're not promised tomorrow, we're not even promised tonight, even though I do hope I make it to my Easter dinner. What we're promised is right now. Today is the day of salvation. Now is the time to choose. To not choose to follow Jesus is to choose to reject him. And so what I'm going to do at this time is I'm going to ask that you would please close your eyes and bow your head. And we're going to pray. And if you're here and maybe at one point in your life you were walking with the Lord and you've walked away. And you know that you need to come back to the Lord today. You've seen the things happening in this world. The very things that the Bible has talked about for hundreds of years, nearly thousands of years, and even more so, things that are coming to pass before our very eyes. Did you know that the Bible actually said 
that there will come a point where we, we receive a, a chip on our right hand or on our forehead. And it makes perfect sense. You can scan it to buy food and it has all your records on it. I mean, they're developing them now. We have the technology and the Bible had already talk, talked about this thousands of years ago. That this day would come. And so maybe now for you that have maybe grown up in the church or have walked, you know, with the Lord at some point in your life and have walked away, you're thinking to yourself, oh no, this is actually really happening. Jesus will come again. I will give an account for my life. Well, I'm going to invite you to rededicate your life to Jesus today. And then for those of you that maybe are here for the first time in anything like this, and maybe in all honesty, you might have just come for the Easter egg hunt, but you're, you've sat through here and listened to this. I want you to know that that forgiveness is available to you. The only unpardonable sin would be for you to reject God's offer of forgiveness to you. That's the only thing that won't be forgiven. If you say, I reject forgiveness, well then we can come to the logical conclusion that you are not forgiven. But for those who do, commit their life to Jesus and say, Lord, forgive me of my sin. We find that God is faithful to forgive us and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And so would you please bow your heads and close your eyes as we pray. Father, we thank you so much for sending your son Jesus to die on the cross for the sins of the world. We thank you, Lord, that with all the turmoil and all the crazy that's happening around the world, that we have a constant, and that is our hope in you. You are the same yesterday, today, and forever. And Lord, we thank you for sending Jesus to die on the cross. We thank you, Lord, that Jesus not only paid the price for our sins, but he also conquered death by rising again on the third day. And that's what we proclaim today. And so, Lord, I ask with every eye closed and head bowed, if there are those that are here that at one point have walked with the Lord, but have walked away and need to come back to you, that they would make that decision to follow you today. I also pray for those that may have never put their faith in Jesus, but they realize that they have done things that are wrong. And that wrong is called sin. And sin separates them from God. I pray that today they would find that forgiveness through a personal relationship with Jesus. And so, again, with every eye closed and head bowed, if you're here and you've never given your life to Jesus and you would like to be forgiven of your sins then very simply, I'm going to ask that you would just raise your hand and say, yeah, that's me. Just very simply, hold your hand up and say, yes, I'd like to give my life to Jesus and be forgiven of my sins. Every eye closed, every head bowed. Anybody else, just hold your hand up so I can see it. And I'm going to pray for you. Anybody else? I see over there in the back too. Anybody else? Just hold your hand up and say, yeah, that's me. It's very simple. It's nothing strange. Maybe you've always wondered what it's like for God to speak to you. And now in your heart, you're feeling, I need to be right with God. The Bible tells us that that is the work of the Holy Spirit drawing you to God, showing you, yes, you've done wrong things, but even greater than that wrong is God's forgiveness and love for you. So anybody else, if you've never given your life to Jesus and would like to, would you please raise your hand? And I'm going to lead you in a very simple prayer. Anybody else, just hold your hand up. And also today, if you at one point were walking with the Lord and you've walked away and you need to come back to the Lord today, would you raise your hand and say, yes, I need to rededicate my life to Jesus today? Because I'm going to pray for you right now. Anybody else? Just hold your hand up. Right on. Anybody else? Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much, Lord, for the work that you did for us on the cross. Lord, we thank you for forgiveness of sins. And Lord, I ask now that you would give these, your sons, your daughters, these men, women, young and old, now the boldness that they need to follow after you, to turn from their sin and to follow you with all of their heart. I know, I know that you're going to meet them exactly where they're at. Please, Father, would you move by your spirit? And we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's all stand.